Hey everybody, I'm Michael Steele. Welcome to the Michael Steele podcast. Always a treat when you're in the neighborhood. So I'm excited about our conversation today as I am with all of them. But you know, every once in a while, you, you, you just like to sort of settle down with an old, with an old friend and kind of uh, chat about some stuff. Uh, that would be Keith Boykin, a TV and film producer, national political commentator. It's a New York Times bestselling author, former uh, White House aide to President uh, Bill Clinton. Um, he's going to drop by and we're just going to cover sort of an array of conversations around uh, certainly what's going on with um, with the economy uh, and SB Bank. We're going to get a little bit into uh, the conversation around uh, the shifting tides um, politically between Mike Pence and Donald Trump and and the, the, the evolving presidential race. Uh, we'll also get into uh, what's happening in my home city of D.C. Uh, and uh, the the realities that, um, you know, uh, Democrats and Republicans have a problem when it comes to D.C. Uh, so we'll get into that. It's a lot uh, that we're going to talk about. I'm glad you could be a part of the conversation. Um, Keith brings a wealth of experience, uh, having taught at American University, the Institute for Research in African American Studies at Columbia University and City College of New York. Uh, he's also the co-founder and first board president of the National Black Justice Coalition. Um, it's just a, a well-rounded conversation. I think you'll enjoy it. So stay tuned and sit back and get ready for a great conversation with Keith Boykin, right after this on the Michael Steele Podcast. Well, everybody, welcome to the Michael Steele Podcast. It is always a treat when you get to drop in, especially when I got a brother I think you're going to really enjoy. Um, <laughs> as I mentioned, uh, Keith Boykin is, uh, uh, Boykin is a... a TV and film producer. So that means he's like Hollywood. <laughs> yeah, he's Hollywood. Uh, but uh, even more so, he's a national political uh, commentator and a best selling New York Times author. Welcome. Hey, Michael, it's good to be here with you. It's good to be with you, Keith. Uh, it's been a while since we've been in person, but it's good to see you uh, li living large out there in LA doing this, <laughs> baby. <laughs> Yeah, I'm staying away from the cold. I thought until we got this rain out here, but it's all good. Right, it's all it's all it's good. It's good. It's good. Well, I'm glad I'm glad things are going well and you're behaving yourself. Well, there's a lot, man, to get into, and and the beauty of it is, is you you have commented. Um, I've been following some of your tweets and commentary lately, given uh, the. Just the, the the crazy back and forth between SV Bank and the uh, uh, you know the craziness with Ukraine right now with Republicans the DNC kind of reshifting or shifting the political landscape it, you know it's one of those things that I almost don't even know where to begin because it's all yeah. so good <laughs> it's yeah. just, it's all so good but so let's let's. Let's start with sort of baseline stuff. What's your assessment as you're looking at uh, the setup for next year, hmm. uh, going into a, a presidential cycle? DeSantis now seeming to find some space sounding as stupid as Donald Trump. Um, and that's everybody's applauding that because they think, oh, oh, my God, at least it's not Trump. Um, <laughs> and and Joe Biden uh seemingly navigating the, I don't understand why they're turbulent, but the somewhat turbulent waters inside the DNC uh, with the idea of his possibly running again for president and, and really kind of proving the case that y'all, I'm the best thing you got. So uh -huh. <laughs> let's just saddle up and roll. Uh, how, how are you assessing where we are right now as, as we come into spring? Well, you ask good questions and set up the uh, the, the context very well. Uh, obviously, I'm not an expert on the Republican side, but I've been watching Republican politics for decades now, and I don't see how anybody beats Trump. I I I think Thank Ron you. DeSantis. <laughs> I mean, Ron DeSantis on paper he seems like he's a good candidate, but so is Jeb Bush. You know, <laughs> there's a lot of good candidates in the past who, on paper, seemed like they were gonna 
be a effective presidential prospects. But I, I think the party, the Republican Party has become the party of Trump. And right. I, I've seen a lot of interviews recently where people were kind of getting tired of the drama and the baggage associated with Trump, but they still like Trump. Um, and they think that somehow DeSantis can thread the needle and give them give them all the Trumpiness with all, without all the Trump baggage. But DeSantis hasn't shown himself to be an effective political communicator outside of Florida, I think. Um, and that's a problem. I think he's trying to test the waters now, but he's doing so in a very limited capacity, uh, going for this whole sort of anti-woke issue, which only resonates for the Republican base. It doesn't make him give him any broader appeal beyond that. Obviously, he's trying to appeal for the Republican primary, but it doesn't set him up for any possibility of winning in a general election. And I think at least Trump has shown an ability to do that, even without the, the popular vote win. So, it, you know, if I were a Republican choosing between Trump and DeSantis, it, it, it's it's kind of like, why would you choose the, the imitation when you can have the real thing? <laughs> yeah, just so you know, Trump's going to pull that clip and he's just going to... He's just gonna put it. He's just gonna put it out there, going, "Yeah, that's what I say." Oh. <laughs> so, but you you hit on a couple of things that I think are kind of interesting, and for me, kind of just really drive the underlying narrative. What is it about this this woke crap that seems to just get white folks all excited? And they just and they and look at it, and I and I say that in a in a somewhat generic sense because this is not just a hard right issue. There are a lot of there are a lot of you know Democrats and independents that I've run into who manifest that same pathology when it comes to CRT, um, general wokeness, trans issues, et cetera. What is it that that is driving that in such a way that the Trumps and and DeSantis types are able to create this wedge, which I think, yeah, could create a, a lane or open a lane at least for for a twenty twenty four run. Well, I think there's a long history, as you know, in American politics of fear of the other. I mean, it definitely predates the 20th century, but the 20th century, we saw from the 1920s and the 1950s, the anti-Red scare, the McCarthyism that, that culminated in the 1950s. Uh, and then from the 60s onward, we've seen sort of uh, an anti-Blackness, a fear of the civil rights movement, a fear of difference. Uh, recently, we've seen that it's been expanded since 9-11, uh, a fear of Muslims, uh, and most recently, a fear of immigrants. So what, what the woke... Uh, storyline or narrative does is it plays on all those different fears, the fear of otherness, the fear of difference, the fear that these people are going to come in and teach your children to be accepting of of drag queens and, and critical race theory and, right. and black history and all these other things that, that strike people as being antithetical to the America of their past. The whole idea of make America great again is based on this idea that there was some time in the past when America was a better country than it is now. But it, from when I look back at American history, there was no time in the past where where people of color have been as included as we are today. So it's basically a statement they want to return to that era of the past. And that's a scary prospect for those of us who were not included in that time. Well, you know, you know, it's funny. You make me laugh with that one because I, I am fond of, of pointing out to uh some folks who in the circles I, I used to run around in more frequently than I do today inside the GOP who had this sort of mythological view of the 1950s. Mm. And, and they think that America was just at its nadir. It was just this wonderful thing, you know, between 1951 and 1959. It was just a great moment, you know, white picket fences and you know, a car in the garage and pick, you know, a wife at home and kids in school. Ooh. And I like, you know, I, I told, told a friend of mine, I said, dude, the 1950 wasn't that kind of white folks either. <laughs> what are you talking about? You talk to the folks in Appalachia and Mississippi, Alabama, you know, it's just like this, this notion. But I think what it really boils down to is they didn't have to deal with black folks the way they do now. 
they didn't have to face them. They weren't in my neighborhood. But my mom moved into her, our neighborhood in Petworth in 1952. Those white folks got the hell up out of there. <laughs> they were gone. They didn't want any parts. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> this this black woman and her husband coming up in, in in the neighborhood. So there was a sense of not having to deal with it, race, the realities of race, uh, others, as you well put it, uh, like they do today. So they sort of have this view of a period that really never existed. I, I think you're right about that in so many different ways. And I would even add another dimension to this, too. Um, is that the 1950s? Um, aside from the aside from the race issues, it was a very complicated time in American history because it was a post-war period. Yep. The, the GI Bill was offering uh, mortgages mortgages to uh, to middle-income white people primarily, so they could move to the suburbs. Uh, They're offering college educations to people so they could help help to pay for their college education. That was that was government welfare. It was government yep. welfare that was supporting primarily white people at that time. But in addition, in the 1950s, we had a top marginal tax rate of 94% under President Dwight Eisenhower in 1950. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think people want to go back to that. And <laughs> people who are saying that at least don't want to go back to that. I don't even think Democrats want to go back to 94% to top marginal tax rate. So I think that people really don't understand everything that happened in the 1950s and why we were coming out of that sort of uh, that 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 war era and trying to reestablish what kind of country it would be. And it set up the, set up the plane for the, the civil rights movement that began in 1954 with the Brown versus Education Board of Education decision in 1955 with the Montgomery bus boycott. But... The thing that happened, and this is the thing that I always tell people, and I was just saying this recently about Marion Williamson, actually. Mm -hmm. um, the Democratic Party was a racist political party. I mean, I right. my opinion... My opinion is that all, all, both parties were racist. Um, and, and what happened is that in 1964, the Democrats essentially committed apostasy amongst their the, the, the Southern Democrat late faithful by, by, by Lyndon Johnson signing the Civil Rights Act. And in so doing, you know, the famous quote where he said, we lost the South for a generation. Well, not only that, but it was a statement that the, the people who were white and Democrat, even if they weren't in the South, who, who related to the idea of having government involved in doing some things, didn't like the idea of government involved in doing things to help black and brown people. So it was there was a transition that took place that, that after the 1960s. I saw Marion Williamson recently make a statement uh, critiquing the Democrats' uh, decision to move Iowa and New Hampshire away from the beginning of the primary mm -hmm. process. And she said the Democratic Party needs to return to its roots. And um, I don't understand the, the logic behind that. Having South Carolina at the beginning of the primary process is a part of the Democratic Party's roots, at least in the past 50, 60 years, because right. black voters are the most loyal constituents of the Democratic Party. Before that time, the Democratic Party wasn't really as kind to black voters. And, and they they tried to sort of give uh, lip service to that, to that group, but they weren't really uh, as supportive. The Republican Party historically had been the party that was supportive of, of African-Americans. Yeah, I, and it, that part of the history, that sort of changing of places um, historically um, is it, a very interesting and dynamic um, uh, process because you you begin to get a sense of the inner workings or at least the inner thinking of some Republicans who had made the calculation rightly that you could not win the, the White House, the presidency, without going through the South. Right because that's where the power base uh, nationally was. It was in the Southern states. The Democrats owned the Southern states since Roosevelt. Um, we had New England and the Northeastern, you know, sort of Republican establishment, which people still talk about today. And that's why they talk about today, because that's where we were anchored. Um, but then you have this Nixonian view, really, which began with Goldwater, who rejected civil rights and said, no, we're not doing that. Johnson who was, you know, a segregationist, embraced civil rights, <laughs> pissed off the Democrats. It's exactly why, in fact, uh, as, I, as I'm fond of saying, Kennedy went to, to Dallas to shore up the Democratic Party, which going into the 64 election um, in, 19, in late 1963 was seeing some cracks uh, in that base for Democrats. So he was going down to shore up and rally and rally the Democrats. Um, so you can begin to understand how these dynamics kind of played out. And you raise the point about 
the Democrats sort of taking the next step. And and I think the way you put it is right. It is kind of going back or at least recognizing what your strength is and moving South Carolina to the head of the line. How do you assess that playing out in terms of shaping not so much the 2024 cycle, but the 28 cycle when Biden is off mm. is out of the picture and let's assume, you know, whether he wins or lose, it's going to be an open seat for Democrats um, in 28. Moving South Carolina up, putting Michigan in play, um, putting, you know, uh, Iowa and uh, New Hampshire somewhere else in the timeline, specifically Iowa, which everyone's sort of like, oh, my God, Iowa. Um, how, how do you see that kind of playing out? That that's a great question. That you know, it's hard in politics, as you know, to predict uh, uh, six weeks in advance, but right. uh, six years in advance, I'm not sure I, I could even get close to that. It, I, a lot depends on who the candidates are. And one of the things I remember studying in political science classes back in college was the law of unintended consequences. Yes. It started in the 1970s when they changed the primary process, and there were all sorts of unintended con consequences they didn't anticipate. And then Jesse Jackson comes along in '84 and '88 and changes the changes the primary process again the democratic party um and so i'm not sure we know at all what's going to happen but i do know is one thing i do know for sure is that black and brown voters um in places like nevada and michigan and south carolina will finally have more of a say in determining who will be the initial front runner instead of iowa and new hampshire which are 1.9 percent and four percent black uh four percent yeah black so th those places are overwhelmingly white um and and that's not reflective of where the, of the Democratic Party today. The Democratic Party is a multicultural, multiracial, multigenerational party. And the people who elect those, the the, the party, uh, the, not the spokesperson, but the standard bearer, should be reflective of that as well. Yeah, and that's and and I, I think in a lot of ways, Republicans are kind of whistling past that that tombstone at this point, thinking better you than me but if they don't adapt to the changing dynamics it will be thee i mean that that tombstone will be yours politically As, what, what do you mean by that i'm not sure i understand well what, well what i mean is they're looking at what the D democrats are, are are doing with their upcoming primary process and going not us we don't need to do that uh, we're sticking with iowa we're sticking with the hampshire you know, because that's where our white base is. Primarily, that's what I I remember having that fight inside the RNC when I tried to change the primary process and recommended that we go to a rotating or go to uh, a different style of primary that sort of mixed up the opportunity to create more dy dynamics so that the so the cream would actually rise uh, within the process and got shot down. Iowa and New Hampshire would have none of it. And, and, and so forth. we were able to change some things um, with respect to the primary, got to add uh, Nevada, because uh, we only did three primaries. We did Iowa, New Hampshire, and South Carolina. And then we added N Nevada in, in 2012 um, to the slate. Everyone thinks it's always been there. It's not. Uh, and we worked that out with the Dems because the Dems had already had four states. So my point is the Dems have kind of led in this sort of uh, reform of the reform within the primary system. And it, my argument is, if we don't look more creatively as Republicans at how to embrace the demographic shifts, that tombstone that the Democrats have planted and moved move beyond, which is the old way of or you know, doing the primary, will be, will be where we'll get stuck. And, well, and 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 the politics are going to, I think, necessarily dictate, if not certainly by 28, I think that you're going to see Republicans kind of revisit this after this primary system. I, I agree with you because I think there's been a pattern um, in the Republican Party um, over the course of some time now where they sort of criticize and disagree with what they call the Democrats identity politics. Right. Um, and then a few years later, they kind of jump on and do the same thing. I mean, right. 
I mean, I, I remember going way, way back to when Walter Mondale chose Geraldine Ferraro to be his running mate in 1984. And a lot of people criticized that decision. Some people thought it was a great historic decision, but a lot of people criticized his identity politics. Um, when when Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton ran in 2008, a lot of people criticized the Democratic Party for focusing on identity politics. And then what did John McCain do? He picked Sarah Palin as his running mate, uh, sort of following, following suit. Right. Um, we saw the same thing in 2006, I think it was, no, 2004, when Obama first ran for the U.S. Senate and all the other white Republican candidates who, who were his, his, his opponents dropped out and they ended up choosing your, I don't know if you know him, Alan Keyes. Oh, yeah, I knew Alan. Alan well. of all places. Yeah. Why would you pick Alan Keyes from Maryland to come run against Barack Obama in Illinois, except for one thing? He's a black guy. He's a black I mean, guy. He, you pick the black guy to go up against the black guy. Yeah. And, yeah. and now they're doing the same thing because, I mean, I, I don't know why Nikki Haley is running or why Tim Scott is running, but I don't honestly think that they have a chance of beating Tim, Donald Trump, and I think that they're actually campaigning for, for vice president, assuming Tim Scott runs. Uh, but I think they they think there could be a, there's a good chance they could be vice president on the, on the running of the on the ticket as a running mate. And I think that's likely that Trump or DeSantis, if if he somehow by America were elected, might choose one of them or someone like that because they know that even though they critique Kamala Harris and the Democrats' identity politics, they know that this is a formula that they have to sort of begrudgingly embrace, even while they're attacking the Democrats for doing it. Right. I, I would say with anyone other than Trump, uh, the picket for the GOP in 2024 will not be all white. So if it is DeSantis, it, he will have a Nikki Haley or a Tim Scott because that's pretty the pretty much it. That's the water's edge, you know. <laughs> you know? They're not calling me, so we know that ain't happening. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that'll be it. But you know, I, I think you're right in that regard. Um, that it sort of creates this this pressure for the party to sort of, among a lot of other things, deal with the fact that demographically they're just falling further behind and it won't be enough just to go ahead and placate by slap dashing some person of color on a ticket and thinking see we are dei too <laughs> 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 you know after after ron DeSantis is <laughs> now running his dumb ass mouth talking about oh yeah the the sv bank uh, implosion was because you know the bank did DEI, and and it just and you know since that's been happening, all these national banks have been incompetent. I'm like, okay, it just that's the stuff that really pisses me off with people who know better, right? And when they use race um, so cynically, look, I'd rather I'd rather the day, and I'll put it in the context like this for you, Keith. When growing up. I had family in New York and family in South Carolina. I always preferred going to South Carolina. You know why? Because I always knew where I stood. Yeah. Right? They weren't, they weren't hiding their shit. They were like, you know what? We don't like you Negroes. We don't want you coming into our businesses. And folks, I'm not talking the 1960s. I'm talking about the 1980s and 90s when I would go down to South Carolina. I have, I have friends who still belong to all white country clubs, right? back in the day. In fact, one of the candidates who ran against me for national chairman in 2006 was still a member of an all-white country club and got embarrassed and resigned, lost the chairmanship race, and guess what he did immediately after losing? Rejoined the all-white country club. Of course, right. So <laughs> at least I know what I got there, you know? You have these guys like DeSantis who put on the slick suit, and they try to sound all inclusive, but they tr but they are also at the same time creating these narratives in which they are they are very much antithetical to uh, the idea, the cause, the interest, the history of people of color, and it's just so infuriating. And I, I don't know ultimately how it's going to play out for the party in this cycle. I just, I can't wait if, if DeSantis, and I've already extended this invitation, and we'll do it again, Mr. DeSantis. If you get the nominee, please come to Maryland. I'd love to invite you to Maryland and to do a town hall 
at at uh, Coppin State or Morgan State University <laughs> or Louis State, uh, um, and sit down and tell these young black people your views on on CRT and wokeism and black history and books uh, that black authors write, uh, and it, and we'll see how that goes. But it also, I think, Keith opens another door, uh, another side of the conversation that you see this sort of elbowing beginning with Mike mm -hmm. Pence. Um, oh, wow. You, <laughs> you recently tweeted out, I heard Mike Pence gave a speech criticizing Trump for the January 6th insurrection, but he's the key witness in the case and he's too afraid to testify against him. That's not courage, that's cowardice. Um, I agree. A thousand percent, because don't sit there and tell me, oh, you know, yes, he put my wife and my kids and my family and the and the capital in, in danger. But then when the police was put it in street terms, the police come and ask you, could you come and testify what you saw and witnessed at the scene of the crime? And you're like, you know what? <laughs> I can't do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know. I think about 10, 15 years ago, there was a big debate in the public sphere about this no snitching code among people in black communities. Uh, right. The idea that if they saw, if black people saw something in, in a community in a black city or black area neighborhood, that a lot of black people didn't feel like they wanted to snitch on the people who were committing crimes because they didn't want to, they didn't trust the law enforcement to do something about it. Uh, they do the right thing about it. And I feel like that's kind of what we're seeing in the, the GOP <laughs> right now, this whole sort of no snitching thing. You know, snitches right. get snitches. And <laughs> I think they're afraid to go against Donald Trump for any reason. And the, the, the most cowardly thing of all is that Mike Pitts is out here on the book tour, promoting, promoting his book everywhere, hawking that anywhere he can, goes to the gridiron dinner behind closed doors <laughs> with no cameras, and then he has the courage to say that Donald Trump will be held accountable by history. <laughs> well, history his, history doesn't happen by accident. It happens because people do something to make that history. I mean, exactly. if, if, if the Watergate committee decided to say, oh, well, you know, Richard Nixon will be held accountable by history, so we're not going to do anything. That That's cowardice. The whole point of people who are in that moment of history is to stand up and do their jobs. He has had the opportunity repeatedly to do so and has declined. All you have to do is testify. If you can say it to the gridiron dinner, if you can say it in a book, if you can say it in your interviews on television, why can't you go and say it under oath to Jack Smith or whomever else is asking you questions for the investigation? I, it, it's, a, it's a fascinating moment when you find political figures who in one sense really have to confront their political mortality. In other words, that's the end game. Oh, if I say something, then the base is going to vote against me or they're not going to support me. And these are the same people who for every moment up to that point, emphasize and stress the value of law and order, democracy, structure, form, all these things that would require you, right, when when asked to uh, help us get this right and do right by the right. victims of January 6th, the officers who lost their lives, the, the, the Capitol Hill um, police and staff who were affected by this, and mostly for the country that, that is screaming for something to be done and for someone to be held accountable, that these people just say no. They just say no. And then you've got the Jim Jordan sitting there talking about, we're going to demand, you know, when we submit these subpoenas that people show up. I'm like, dude, you got a freaking subpoena over your head right now you haven't responded to from the January 6th committee. What? So this double-sided view of the world, to me, is just... It's a fascinating piece of American politics today. Well, again, I think this goes back to race in our country's history as well, because the whole idea of law and order as a campaign theme started, I believe, in the 1960s um, in the South. And it was designed not so that 
we could have equal law and order standards that everyone could abide by. It was designed basically to stop civil rights protesters and outside agitators, as they call them. Anyone who was advocating for the civil rights of African Americans, uh, or anyone who took it beyond that, the the people who were who were uh, rioting in the streets. But the law and order only applied to black people. And I think that what the sad thing is, what I'm getting the feeling now is that for a lot of Republicans, law and order isn't something they truly believe in. They believe in law and order in order to keep black and brown people in check, but not to regulate their own behavior. And that's a very sad state of affairs about our country. That's right. Because you know, you know what happens if you don't regulate us. <laughs> We go and do <laughs> we go and do creative shit. Right, <laughs> you know, exactly. right. Create steam like stop signs and, and right. uh, stop lights and right. you know split blood plasma and all that kind of stuff because you know we we can't do anything else. It just it's it's so annoying in so many levels. Um, I want to take a quick break uh, and when we come back, I want to learn a little bit more about the National Black Justice Coalition, uh, which you uh, co-founded. Um, and and the work that you're doing there. And I definitely want to talk to you about um, quitting. Okay. <laughs> Which right. You seemingly yeah. know a I'll little bit about. about. <laughs> okay. All right. We're All right. having a great conversation with my buddy, uh, Keith Boykin. We'll be back right after this. Welcome back, everybody, to Michael Steele Podcast. We are having fun with Keith Boykin, uh, author, um, you know, TV personality, best time, uh, best time, uh, New York Times best-selling author. <laughs> um, you you have you you co-founded um, and are president. We're president. Are you, are you currently still president? No, I'm not. I was okay. co-founder and first board president. Of first the board National president. Black Justice Coalition. That's that's right. First board president of the National Black Justice Coalition. What was that about? What was the work in that space uh, geared towards? Well, originally it started because of this issue of marriage equality back in 2003. Massachusetts became the first state to uh, legalize same-sex marriage. Right. And um, there was a lot of division of opinion about that in the Black community, but I saw there were a lot of African-American pastors on television who were condemning it, but there wasn't anybody who was really speaking out in favor of marriage equality um, in the public sphere. So we created an organization to, to fight both racism and homophobia in black and brown communities and also in, in non-black communities and spaces. And so, um, it, it really grew out of that. The idea of uh, understanding that the old axiom that Dr. King spoke of that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, mm -hmm. that we couldn't just be concerned about one group's, um, um, uh, freedom, but also about all, all of our freedoms. And so the organization has really grown from there. That was 20 years ago uh, when we when we founded it. I'm no longer uh, on the board or in, in affiliated with the organization in that capacity. But I noticed that they have now been involved in leading the charge uh, on against Florida Governor Ron DeSantis and um, the whole AP history African-American history course, uh, leading the charge to include uh, uh, the, the some of the themes that were left out from the AP African-American history course curriculum that has been under uh, debate recently. Uh, and I, I think that's important that we have a history that includes all of us because the history does include everyone. And right. it's important that, that, we don't, it, that we don't forget some groups uh, as we talk about that history. We, I had an interesting conversation. I always have interesting conversations with uh, my buddy Jonathan Capehart uh, of the Washington Post, and one of one of the conversations um, when the narrative around gay marriage uh, began after Joe Biden's uh, sort of uh, <laughs> hey, this is what we're doing now, and and yeah. and Obama's like, what, 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 what are we doing? <laughs> um, is how this issue has evolved in the Black mm. community, which is why mm. I wanted to focus on the coalition's work, because I would, I and tell me if I'm off base, but I, I would argue that it played an important role in sort of reframing the conversation around what it is to be Black and gay. Yeah. Um, because there was such a... a, a some would argue stranglehold on a conventional thought that this lifestyle, as some would characterize it, is antithetical to 
the black community on so many levels. How are you going to tell your grandmama, let alone your mama and your brother, uh, that you're gay? But the fact remains that there were a lot of gay people <laughs> who are living that life um, and trying to live that life to, and find themselves. How has this changed? Because now when you turn on the television, this is, this is my little side, this is where Jonathan and I still have a laugh, because I look at these commercials and they just, I mean, they are 90% two black men or a black guy and a white guy, you know, sort of having an intimate moment. I'm like, that just would not play um 10 years ago 15 years ago in a way that it does today so it does speak about the evolution talk a little bit about that particularly when you're now looking at almost the back end of this keith with the anti-trans and uh the the resurgence uh certainly in the anticipation the supreme court will shoot down That's gay marriage oh yeah oh, gay marriage yeah 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 well yeah, there's so much to, to, to say there. I, I mean, <laughs> I graduated from college in 1987 at Dartmouth in, in New Hampshire, and I went to work for Michael Dukakis when he ran for president um, and that ill-fated campaign. Um, for two years, I worked for him. I mean, and, let me, hold up. Excuse me. You graduated college in 1987? Yeah. Oh, damn. 1987. <laughs> and went, went to work for Michael Dukakis in, in 87, 88. <laughs> And um, it was the, it, it was a weird experience for me. I was I was a, a press aide. I worked on the campaign plane, so I was with the candidate every day. And never once did I hear any mention of LGBTQI issues during the course of the campaign. It just never came up at all. Right. Uh, then in '92, I worked for uh, Bill Clinton when he ran for president. And suddenly the big issue of the campaign, it was sort of a subtle issue, but it was a big issue, was the issue of gays in the military. Um, right. And it became even bigger after Clinton was elected and he said he was going to follow through on his campaign promise, which he didn't do, but he said we try. Um, and suddenly this whole gay issue became front and center. But the thing is that in when I graduated from college, the idea of gay marriage was unthinkable. The idea of a black president was unthinkable. The idea of trans inclusion wasn't even on the table. There's a lot of things that people are talking about today that I don't think even, I don't think young people have any sense of just how how impossible those ideas were to even conceive of in public yeah, dialogue, yeah. much less political spaces in the 80s and 90s. So then we get to 2008, as you mentioned, uh, Barack Obama runs for president. At that time, he was supporting civil marriage and not uh, civil unions, not and not marriage. Uh, but, but that didn't change until 2012, when Joe Biden became the first person to sort of lead the way. And then Michelle Obama joined in shortly after that. And then finally, Barack Obama said that he'd evolved and he supported marriage equality. At that point, Black community support started to change dramatically because there'd been it'd been slowly creeping up with the work that activists had been doing. But President Obama shifted the dialogue completely for black community, uh, black communities, because prior to that, black people had been overwhelmingly opposed to, to yeah. gay marriage. Yeah. And after Obama came out in favor of it, black people came out in support of it. So it was a huge it shows leadership really matters. You know, sometimes you think one person can't do that much or one person who has a, a voice or a bully pulpit uh, can't really change things but you really can uh, and I always encourage people if you have a if you have an opportunity if you have a platform if there's something you believe in it's not hurting anybody by all means speak up and use your voice for good yeah I, I think you, you you put your finger on a very important point for me about leadership it is why uh, we see the level of of rot inside the GOP right now is because of a lack of leadership. We have suddenly become a pro-Putin, not a evil empire party uh, mm -hmm. as we once were under Reagan. Why? Because Reagan led us to, you know, not just to believe, but to act on principally that Russia was an opponent. Romney reminded us of that in 2012, got vilified for it, but Republicans stood fast with him, right? Mm -hmm. Today, Romney's an outlier when he says that, and Putin is, is the play. Um, and it's all because of the leadership that now decides to go in a different direction for crass political purposes, not the principle. And so you can make the case that whether it was Joe Biden or Barack Obama or whatever, there was a, pr a principle position articulated in such a way that the, that 
a growing majority of the American people mm -hmm. felt more comfortable expressing their own personal agreement with that principle um, and, and align themselves um, with that sentiment politically. Uh, and, and so what is really an interesting test now is what gets clawed back and to what degree and extent do the American people allow a Supreme Court, for example, to claw that back as they have with Roe. I'm still curious. I, I don't think the end game has occurred yet with Roe. I don't know, though, if voters will just get to a point where they say, well, that's just it. That's going to be the law of the land and we'll just live in a bifurcated country in which these states are going to be pro-Roe, these states are going to be anti-Roe, um, and I just got to figure out where I want to live. Yeah, this is complicated, and, and leadership does require sometimes taking positions that are not popular. That's what Dr. King spoke about, too. Right. And um, I, before I get to the, the specifics of the role point, I do want to ma make sort of a, a side note here about leadership in the Republican Party. I've been saying for a long time that I don't think Mike Pence has a chance, and I still believe that. But I do believe, if and you can correct me if I'm wrong about this, mm -hmm. I do believe that the only, I, 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 and this is just a new idea that came up within the past two or three days. I was watching something on CNN the other day, and I saw an interview. I think it's in Tyler, Texas. They went to this place. Mm -hmm. It's the Trumpiest county in the, in America or whatever. Uh, and they interviewed people. And I heard several people there. A lot of people said they would not vote for Trump again. But, but several people said they would support Mike Pence. I was shocked to hear that. Um, and I think to me, what that states is that if Mike Pence showed some courage and leadership and standing up to Trump, that yeah. there is a pathway for him to stand to stand not so much as a mini Trump or Trump imitator like Ron DeSantis, but as an anti-Trump with more authority than anybody else can speak because he worked with Trump for four years. He could possibly navigate that lane and thread a needle and create a path for him to the nomination. I, I hadn't thought about that as a possibility because I never thought he would ever do such a thing. But that to me, to me, seems like the only way he could do that sort of leadership. Anyway, getting back to your larger point. No, I agree. With, but I agree with that point. I think you're right. Yeah, um, I, I think. I don't know how far the pendulum can swing before people decide they've had enough and, and push back again. And I expected actually there'd be more pushback to the abortion um, decision from the Supreme Court last year in Dobbs. Uh, but there was a resistance, obviously. I mean, we saw that within the election. Right. Uh, the Republicans didn't pick up as many seats as we thought they would. They, they lost some of the special elections in part because of the, the Dobbs decision. And I think, you know, the Republican Party has to figure out what it's going to do next, because the, the momentum hasn't slowed on from the, the, the group of people in the party who want to ban abortion altogether. Um, and I don't I don't hear a lot of people talking about that anymore. Right. Uh, I, I don't I don't know if the Republican Party is what's going to be in the Republican Party platform in 2024 on abortion. Are they going to call for a national ban? Um, is that going to be popular? Is that going to work? I, I, I don't know how that how that works. But when you talk about marriage equality, affirmative action and, and other issues that are up for grabs now, I think at some point something becomes a straw that breaks the camel's back and people decide this is enough. Um, and I feel like the Republicans are teetering on, on the brink of that right now with all the sort of the anti-woke nonsense that Ron DeSantis is pushing. Right. I mean, how many different communities can you possibly attack before you, you the numbers just don't add up anymore for you? When you're attacking uh, LGBTQ people, you're attacking women, you're attacking um, African-Americans. Um, I, I don't know exactly where they feel that they're going to get support from unless it's just from straight white guys. And yeah, that's not a majority of the population, believe it or not. It, it, yeah. Yeah. Last time checked, uh, last time I checked, you're absolutely right about that. And, and I think, I think all of those points you've made are going to be, uh, they're going to be churned through in the GOP because they have to be the, the fight uh, I think is going to be a short lived one sh in the short term simply because they want, to, they want to get set up to run the race for 24. Right. But like I was saying before about reforming the primaries for the 28 and 32 cycle, this same fight that they're avoiding now is going to happen. And I think it becomes even more important and more uh, 
deadly maybe um, if they lose in 24 because then then there will be those who will point the finger at the at the Pences and the McConnells and others and say, look what you have wrought. And then there'll be those who will point the finger at the Trumps and, and the DeSantis's and say, look at what you have wrought. And this will be the culmination of a battle, quite honestly, Keith, that has been sort of roiling aside the party since Reagan left in 89. Because when Reagan left in 89, the question was, who's the next Ronald Reagan? And the party never answered that question um, because Bill Clinton, inter Bush. yeah, Bush, but Bill Clinton kind of interrupted that process. Um, and they never really settled on an answer. And they've been fighting that fight inside ever since. See, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask this as a question because I'm not sure... I always feel uncomfortable talking with you about Republican issues because I know you're much more of an expert on no, this. No, no, please. But I'm not sure that in 2024, if Trump loses, that Republicans would just accept that result. I no, think, that's I my point. They're not. Uh, no, I don't, I don't mean in terms of putting the blame at, at some one person or another within the party. I think they would they would accuse the Democrats of of, of stealing the election again. Oh, that's a given. Trump, <laughs> well, yeah, but I, I mean, I don't think it's a given if DeSantis loses or if another D Republican loses. But I think if Trump w runs and wins a nomination and, and loses the, the general election, I don't know if they're going to start pointing fingers at anybody. I think they're just going to start saying the election was a fraud. And I don't know. And you've got people in place now in a number of states and more potentially in the coming year, in the coming year or so, that could help to to enable uh, some sort of uh, anti-democratic uh, uh effort to stop the, the certification of the election, although it would be unsuccessful. But I just don't know how the Republicans, I don't get any sense that the Republicans are going to do a great deal of introspection uh, after that. Uh, we saw this, remember when they did the, were you, were you in charge when no. they did the autopsy? No, I was not in charge. I would never have done an autopsy. Okay. <laughs> okay. But they did the would. autopsy. Well, yeah. And they go thought ahead. that things were going to change. And did anything change after that? I mean, for well, a year they, or two, it but did. They, but, they, but that actually raises a very interesting point. The autopsy did point to where they needed to change. Okay. So I, I kind of created the change. Reince knew this going into 12. But Reince undid everything I did. He, he de deconstructed everything I built, the national networking, the deep dive into communities of color. So the reason why I was running around the country talking about hip hop Republicans was trying to set the narrative and reset the relationship so that we can at least begin to have some level of connection to what's going on out there and talk about it in terms that people recognize. They, he threw all that out. We get we get our clocks cleaned in 12. They decide, oh, OK, yeah, I guess we should do an autopsy to see what went wrong. I didn't need to do an autopsy after 12, after 06 and 08, right? Uh, well, we got clobbered because I knew I, I'm a county guy. I'm a state guy. I knew what was going on. So this idea of doing the autopsy is more performative than anything. And how do you know that? Because Trump came along and crapped all over it. <laughs> <laughs> First thing out of his mouth yeah. was like, oh, yeah, Mexicans are murderers and rapists. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, you yeah. guys want to do something with Hispanics, right? I, okay, anyway, but they're murderers and rapists. So th this idea of the fight, for me, is is something that is just, it's, it's an ongoing thread inside the GOP. And my thinking, at least right now, and this is really where I was going with that, was that you will have, if whether it's DeSantis or Trump or anyone else, if they lose in 24, that will be losing since 2018, right? So you will have, what, four cycles of losses, 18, 20, 22, and then 24. And that puts an enormous amount of pressure, particularly if you know, you're 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 losing in such a way that you're not even in play with the popular vote. Right. Um, and and where you should be winning places like Wisconsin and Michigan, you're losing. Texas, for me, Keith, is this close to becoming a battleground state. 
I've been I've been hearing that for years and years. I'll I'll believe it when I see. Well, I'll see well, it I but believe it when the I see folks it, I been, yeah, but the folks who've been saying it for years and years were kind of speaking prematurely. You go back. Yeah. I mean, I've been I've been what I've been saying since I was a state chairman in two thousand was that after spending uh, some time in Texas and watching what the Democrats were doing there, what I saw was they figured out something to put in the sauce to get the voters to change their, their behavior, meaning they, they vote for Democrats, the Democratic mayors, the council members, the judges. Now, the statewide races are a bit more of a challenge for a lot of the reasons that the national race, national races have been uh, a challenge uh, for, for Democrats and Republicans. It's a matter of getting the right formulation of voters. But they are there. In a, in a lot of respects. And so I'm not saying that it's going to happen, but I'm saying they are closer than they've ever been. And when that happens, there's no way Republicans win national campaigns again. This is their truth they've got to confront. Well, I <laughs> that, that makes a lot of sense. And I, I think the demographics are definitely shifting. One of, the, one of the smartest things I heard Nikki Haley say when she announced her campaign was that Republicans have lost the popular vote in seven of the last eight presidential elections. Right. Uh, so that, that's an indication that something isn't working. Um, fortunately for the Republicans, they have a, a, a clutch on power still because of the way the system works. But Texas is like, in a, in a strange way, it's like Florida to me, and I know they're co two completely different states, but they're both states that Democrats have have hoped to take over at some point because of the rising Latino population. It hasn't worked for a number of reasons. It hasn't worked in Florida in part because the the Cuban and South American population in, in South Florida is is more Republican these days than than we, right. we, we expected. But but also um, there are Trump actually did not as badly as I would have expected him to do in, in uh, among yeah. Latino voters, yeah. um, and and Democrats had to figure out what that's all about and and how to how to make that work for for the Democratic Party. It, it, Texas is different because in, in yes you have black not just black but Democratic mayors in Houston and 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 in in Dallas and places like that and Democratic uh, cities, but. At the statewide level, they're still electing Greg Abbott, you know, and and how do you how do you how do you do how do you fight against that when they're even Uvalde, Texas? Remember what would happen? It was happening in Uvalde, and yeah. and the, the Republican controlled uh, elected officials there who were who did nothing about guns, they still voted for those people. So I I don't know I. My heart keeps telling me, yes, Texas could possibly become a, a purple state or something in the future, but it just keeps not happening. It just keeps not happening. <laughs> well, you know, all I all I say to folks is stick a pin in it um, and and yeah. let's and let's revisit and watch it. Um, it's just again for me, you know, part of my. By the way, I'm I'm actually more surprised and impressed by Georgia. Yes. Yeah. And, and I don't know if you if you ever if you ever talked to Charles Blow about his book about about this, the devil you know. But um, I thought that was very prescient. I mean, the idea of like flipping the state of Georgia to the point where now we have two Democratic senators in Georgia. I I would have expected Texas or Florida long before Georgia. See, I, I, I Georgia for me is is actually makes more sense in the timeline, because if you look at the way it's flowing, it's Virginia, uh, North Carolina, right? And you're coming around to, you know, Georgia, Tennessee, these states, um, uh, Louisiana. But why not have, South Carolina? They're 40, almost 40% 40 black. Well, I'm, that's what I'm about to get. These states are kind of on the leading edge of this. I think what the Democrats did with putting the emphasis on South Carolina in their primary process will now just ratchet that that energy up in a way, particularly given the, the level of voting black voters uh, and their participation in the electoral process overall. Um, my only point is going back to what we were saying earlier about what the political landscape was for Republicans in the 1960s. 
Oh, wow. The yeah. key to winning the presidency was the South. Yeah. Guess what? Here we are again. It will be once again that key as states like Georgia, North Carolina, Texas become less easily to count on. You're going to have to work. Republicans are going to have to work to keep Georgia red in a presidential cycle, given what they've been able to do um, with four elections now in the state of Georgia, right? Um, with the spec between special elections and uh, right. general elections. Um, so that's all I'm talking about. When I look at the look at the natural progression and order of things, I'm putting pins along the way, and I'm I'm looking at the South. I hate to say it this way, but I will rising again politically uh, to 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 sort of set the the new bar um, for both parties, where it's not a lock necessarily for either. Well, and also I think you're seeing a demographic shift, not so much in terms of identity demographics, but in terms of movement. People in this state in California are leaving. And in lots of places in the Northeast, they're leaving. They're going down to the South because That's it's it. warmer and cheaper, ta lower taxes and things and things like that. But a lot of those people will be Democrats, too. And I think that's one of the things you know, Republicans are, are bragging about. Oh, we're getting all these new people coming in. But a lot of those people are going to be Democrats. They're going to vote for Democratic candidates. So it's going to have a, at some at some point it's going to have an impact. That's exactly right. So a quick round, Robin, before I let you get up out of oh, here. Yeah, sure. uh, what are your thoughts on uh, the 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 latest anti sort of democratic uh, move with respect to my home city of Washington, DC, um, where the, uh, yeah. Uh, the crime bill? The crime bill got pulled. Uh, you know, a couple of things about this that I found really amazing, uh, particularly with uh, Chair Council Chairman Phil Menderson. So this is the deal, folks. The DC, uh, council uh, had had a rewrite, some would say a sweeping rewrite of its uh, of the city's criminal code, in which it lessened penalties for a number of of crimes. That sort of set off a lot of alarm bells. Uh, council member uh, and chairman Phil Mendelson um, eventually announced withdrawal of the of the of the of the law of the of, of the changes. But, you know, putting the blame on the Republicans, and I get it, yeah, Republicans made a lot of noise, but, you know, he, Democrats are the ones in the Senate that said, nah, we're not doing this. The mayor, Mayor Bowser was like, nah, this is a bridge too far. What, what's your take on, on, the, on the shifts that we see going on there? Well, there's two parts of this. One is sort of the, the the issue itself, the substantive issue of whether the crime bill rewriting made sense at all. But the second part I, is really the, what I'm more concerned about is the democracy part. Um, and I, I'm glad you brought this up because I had a debate, a fierce debate with a friend of mine who lives in Washington, D.C. He's a black lawyer, a progressive Democratic black lawyer who was pissed off at the DC council and he wanted the Senate to overturn this. He, he sent me a message saying, I'm glad they're doing this. And I was shocked to hear this because I mean, I don't, I didn't even know the substance of it at the time, but I just felt like I don't like the idea of the district of Columbia ceding its authority to make its own decisions uh, to the federal government. I find that very problematic because once you open the door, anything could possibly happen. And so I know that Muriel Bowser, the mayor of Washington, D.C., was opposed to the city council right. change. Um, but that's the way democracy is supposed to work. She vetoes it. They override the veto. Um, people get a chance to vote them out if they don't like that. I don't think that the federal government should come in and, and make rules that that overturn the, the decisions of the District of Columbia. If the voters in D.C. don't like it, they can get rid of those people. I, I just find it very, very problematic. And it's one of those issues where I feel like I may be out of sync with the with Democratic Party or, or whomever, right. or even black voters in, in D.C. But I believe in D.C. statehood. I don't think you can have statehood only part of the time, only when it suits your political interests. I think you, if you, if you believe in statehood, you have to give people the aut autonomy to make their own decisions, right or wrong. Well, I, I agree with you as a native Washingtonian. Um, 
I agree with you and side with you on on the substance for me. It's about uh, the democratic principle of the citizens deciding what's in their best interest through the officials that they've elected to serve, uh, to execute on those interests. And when they don't, they can vote them out. Uh, they can have town hall meetings to challenge the decision. Um, but there's always been this sort of, uh, sort of, Peyton, what's the word I want? Not patron, patronizing. Patronizing, it's bad. Yeah. Exactly. Patronizing yeah. attitude from people who don't live, who aren't from DC, who don't live in DC, who don't know jack about DC, coming in and dictating to district residents how they should live their lives and what is good or bad for them or what's in their best interest or not. Uh, let them succeed or fail go grow or shrink on their own not because now i get it dc is not a state it's in a very unique spot um but that is the essence of what home rule was about why that was fought for and achieved and to continue chip away at it to me is just um it's problematic like you said I'm I'm going to take this video when this comes out. I'm going to send it to my friend in D.C. so he can see that, that you're <laughs> saying this. So it's not just me. I felt like I was the only one who was no, saying No, no, you're not. Yeah. No, I, in fact, worked on the first bill, the first constitutional amendment back in 1978 with uh, Walter Fontroy. I was on his staff as, as uh, uh, you know, a student at Hopkins at the time, and I spent uh, a lot of time in D.C. working um, in his office. And that was the first piece of legislation I worked on to, to get it passed and sent out to the states was the D.C. statehood bill. And um, uh, that fight's been going on since the 1970s. And well, here we are. And everybody's got bloody fingers when it comes to why we don't have um, full autonomy for the citizens of the district. Even if you don't want statehood, at least give them full representation. You know, but we can have that conversation. So let's let let's get some thoughts on your latest book, uh, which I thought I love the title. Uh, oh, by the you. way, yeah. about quitting. Why I left my job to live a life of freedom. Um, what does quitting mean to you, man? I, I I just thought that was so cool to just kind of say, hey, it's okay to just say, you know what, I'm done. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I, I do feel uh, that people have a responsibility to themselves. And a lot of times we get sucked up into the corporate culture where we feel like we have to give our lives to our employers. And if we're not there a bit, out working overtime, working weekends, uh, answering every phone call and every text message, we're not doing enough because somebody else will be competing against us. And I, I feel it's important for people to know that you don't have to live that way. I mean, you can choose to do something else. You can you can quietly quit as people are, are doing, or you only do what you're required to do. Or you can actually move on and do something else. You know, 40 million people left their jobs in 2020, uh, 2021, uh, and moved on to do something else uh, during the whole the, the Great Resignation. I think it's important for people to have that autonomy again. One other part about this, I, I posted something about this on Twitter recently because of the the meta layoffs, at Facebook. Right. Um, 10,000 people laid off after 11,000 people were, were laid off just a few months ago. I always tell people, don't believe that companies are loyal to you. They are only loyal to the bottom line. They're not, yes. Exactly. As soon as yes. they have a moment, an opportunity to make a buck without you or get a computer or a robot or... <laughs> or a chat GPT or something to do your job, they're going to, they're going to get rid of you. So you have to constantly be aware of that and, and not put your, your faith in a company to always support you, but to find ways to develop your own skills, to be able to market yourself, to be able to, 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 to create new ways for you to, to, uh, to survive and live in, in, in your own way. Yeah. I, I could not agree with you more. And, and I think the great resignation um, has had a profound impact and an ongoing one um, in uh, the the not just the jobs market, but in the culture of corporate America. Um, I was talking with a friend of mine here in in D.C. and he was he was sort of wringing his hands and concerned that you know he's got this office building that's only sixty percent occupied, right downtown. Why? Because people are not going back to work. They're you know they're they're making choices for their mental health, physical health, um, along the lines of what you've just described, because they realize 
yeah, and the pandemic brought it about, but they did realize, oh my God, I can do something else or I want to do something else. I don't have to do this this way. And that sense of freedom of choice, if you will, um, for how I want to spend eight hours of my day. Yeah, you know, it, it, it seems to be the, the interesting new dynamic that's changing the marketplace. I love the fact that here in Maryland, um, there was a bill that was starting to float, which came up and then receded, but I suspect it'll be back looking at moving to a four-day work week. Uh, oh, more wow. and more jurisdictions are doing that because guess what? That's what the workers are saying they want. I'm more productive four days and four days. That fifth day, dude, I'm living for the weekend. So, <laughs> And, and I, I don't think it just has to be a four-day work week, but I just think having, giving people the freedom, and this doesn't work for every job. You know, if you have right. to be someplace at a particular spot and time right. to do a certain task, you can't do this, but... But giving people um, who who can work remotely the freedom to do so, we don't all have to come in and, and give FaceTime to our bosses and employers just to let them know that we're there when we could be effectively doing other things. Maybe we have a doctor's appointment. Maybe we have to pick up the kids from school. Or maybe we have to take care of our sick grandparents or something like that. We can still work at home and get things done without necessarily being in the office. And I think we should be, you know, as much as people talk about numbers and metrics, we should be focused on the results. Are you able to produce the results that, that are expected of you in this job? Uh, these are the numbers. Do you hit your targets? If you do, it doesn't matter to me whether you work in an office or on the beach, as long as it gets done. That's right. That's right. Because, you know, hitting that target with a, with a Mai Tai in your hand goes a hell of a lot farther. <laughs> <laughs> and you're a lot happier. You're a lot and happier. A lot happier. Yeah. In, exactly. in the, maybe the right. folks at SVB Bank at SV Bank should have uh, thought of doing something like that yeah. <laughs> instead of making crazy ass decisions about uh, you know hedging against inflation and all of that stupid. Uh, listen, man, I know you got to jump, but I, I really appreciate you coming on the, and spending some time with us on the on the podcast and sort of sharing your insights uh, about. Uh, business and politics and life and uh making it work i really appreciate it man thank you so much always a pleasure to be on with you love the conversation. absolutely I, I i know you're gonna head i can see you're out in la you're gonna head out to that beach and sort of grab that high <laughs> tie and, and uh write your next bestseller right that's how that works <laughs> something like that something, something like, like that, that. Exactly. Yeah. all right uh okay. keith boykin tv uh, and film producer just all around good guy, New York Times bestselling author, um, and the author of a book. Check it out, folks, yeah, because I really think you you can appreciate uh, where he's coming from about quitting, why I left my job to live a life of freedom. Uh, it's out now. Grab a copy uh, and go to that beach with that mai tai and read it and enjoy yourself. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> You can you can track and follow and keep up with uh, with Keith on Twitter at Keith Boykin. That's B O Y K I N. Uh, follow me on Twitter at Michael Steele. The podcast at Steele underscore Podcast. Uh, do that download thing because it makes me feel all yummy inside. I love it when you do. Share uh, the link uh, from the YouTube channel and from the podcast with your friends. Uh, the more to marry you. Until next time, be safe, be well, and don't forget your my time. Ha, ha, ha.